Working my way through school in, uh, in retail, I occasionally uh, would come across a dissatisfied customer uh, who was sort of in this retail rant, which almost always ended with the words or some form of, who's in charge? Well, as the lowly sales associate, I was always caught in the middle because I knew what the store policy was. But I also knew the glare that I would get from a, a department manager having to come down onto the main floor and looking at me like, why couldn't you have handled this? And almost without exception, when a manager came down, it was a whole different story. And the whole situation usually ended with the uh, manager assuring that the customer that they are always right. And they would get whatever they had requested. And then to add to that, uh, the sort of the cherry on top was the smug sneer of the customer as I did what they had originally requested. Every profession has its own version of the, hey, who's in charge? Even church ministry. And typically, I guess we think that, uh, well, the ministers are in charge, right? They're the high-profile folks, the ones that are uh, kind of the targets up in front of us. And it's true that sometimes we are in charge. Sometimes it is our responsibility. Sometimes um, the, uh, the buck stops squarely in front of us. And although we complain about it at such times, most of, well, I kind of like believing that, that I'm in control of what's going on and that I can kind of make a difference of what's coming up next. In fact, I like it so much sometimes that I try to take over the reins and, and uh, take control when clearly I am uh, no longer qualified to be running the show or anything else. It's not an exaggeration when I say that I am constantly tempted to play God. Case in point, a confession. I was the, uh, the unofficial head of staff for one day uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> With Bill retiring on a Tuesday and Houston not arriving until Thursday, that left us Wednesday headless. Um, so, Wednesdays are my day off, but I thought, for the sake of the church, I'll, uh, I'll be there at least for a while, and so I had some signs in case people forgot that I was the head of staff uh, for that one, one day, <laughs> without it going to my head at all. And uh, on my door, I placed a little, uh, a little bag, and originally I, I called it a complaint bag, uh, for folks to feel free to use because I wanted my administration to be known as one that was inclusive and open to, to the little people. <laughs> but then I thought, no, I'd rather have my administration be one of optimism and, and being positive. So I crossed out complaint and I put suggestion bag. Well, when I came in then uh, to uh, do the Ash Wednesday service later that evening, uh, I was surprised to know that the bag was practically full. <laughs> and. Uh, I wanted to share with you just what uh, some people think. Um, one of them was, uh, could you do something about your robe? It's, it's uh, possibly a nice flannel or t-shirt instead on Sundays. Think about it. Um, a suggestion, an omelet and carving station in the sanctuary on Sundays. <laughs> Think about it. Um, my Starbucks cup won't fit in the pew cup holder. <laughs> When is an upgrade scheduled? <laughs> uh, I don't believe we should work on Mondays. Wow, okay. And one, a, a little more subtle, um, it, it's the visual. Um, it's a color ad showing three terrific deals. Really, they're steals on smartphones to me. And it simply says, think about it. <laughs> and of course, my absolute favorite, I'm sure you will agree, um, this bag should be taped shut. What possible complaints about you could there be? <laughs> you know, um, oh, well, please, please. <laughs> Don't encourage them. Um, I plan, after the handwriting analysis results are in, I, I plan on uh, personally thanking the folks who contributed to that uh, suggestion bag. 
Um, when the, uh, it's interesting that we just, we forget one of the most basic elements of spirituality uh, in this, this idea of um, thinking that, that we're God instead of God being God and we're not. It's sort of a kindergarten lesson in spirituality, if you will. Even John the Baptist, folks were coming up to him and saying, are, are you the Messiah? Are, are you God? And John said, no, I'm not. There's one coming that, that will be, but I'm not, the, I'm not the guy. And I need to be reminded of that every morning when I stand in front of the mirror, to remember that God is God and I am not. And I always know that if I'm not able to say it on any given day, Kathleen is willing to say it any day, <laughs> several times a day. Yet over the centuries, forgetting that simple fact that God is God and we are not has led to countless tragedies, large and small. They're personal tragedies, national tragedies, even global tragedies. See if you might not agree that Adam and Eve thought that they had this godlike freedom, and they did not. Saul, King Saul, thought that he had a godlike impunity. He did not. David thought that he had this godlike authority over, over who lives and who dies, and he did not. The Israelites thought they had a godlike exclusiveness, and they did not. Good old Peter thought that he had a, a godlike loyalty, and he did not. Paul thought that he had a, a godlike mission to wipe out Christians. He did not. The Romans, uh, they thought they had a godlike ruling power. They did not. The Europeans thought that they alone had a godlike image, and they did not. Americans thought they had a, a godlike manifest destiny. They did not. Hitler thought he had a godlike right to take over the world. He did not. Medical science sometimes thinks it can play God. It cannot. God is God and we are not. It's another way of, of answering the question, who's in charge? God is in charge. David McAuliffe, who was a former uh, president of San Francisco Theological Seminary, said this, by playing at being God so often and in so many different ways, we have succeeded in trivializing the whole concept of God. We don't have the awe uh, that previous generations had. <clears throat> And not just for God, but for his body on this earth, the church. Instead um, of not having any other gods, as the commandments tell us, we sort of have this pantheon of trivial gods. See if any of these sound familiar for you, or as familiar as they sounded for me. There's the, uh, the God of my cause. There's the God of my understanding. There's the God of my nation. There's the God of my my personal experience. There's the God of my body. There's the God of my species. There's the God of my generation. There's the God of my race. There's the God of my gender. There's the God of my class. But only God is God and we are not. God is in charge and God won't be trivialized. In the parable that we just read this morning, Jesus provides sort of a glimpse between the difference of, of God's design and our human desires. And I think answers this question, who's in charge, in some pretty practical terms. So let's look at this a little more closely and see if it has anything to do with us here this morning. This particular parable of Jesus is only recorded in the gospel according to Matthew. And it's sort of this classic parable structure where it kind of sets up this neat story and then it, towards the very end there's this twist, there's this unexpected ending, and it's a major one coming. Matthew introduces this particular parable with his traditional, the kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, it's, that's quoted several times and it's sort of this formula. In the first seven verses of this passage, 
Um, rather slowly, but intentionally and dramatically, it lays out the story and all the characters and the details of it. And there's a landowner, the person who is in charge, who's described as kind of a, a hands-on uh, manager uh, and owner. Probably only moderately well off. I mean, we, we see that he's able to hire quite a few workers, but uh, he goes himself to the marketplace to get those and to recruit his, uh, his workers for the day. Uh, that's kind of unusual. If he were really wealthy, he would have people to do that, but he goes himself. In fact, we don't even read until verse 8 that he actually has a manager who assists or oversees the workers and his fields or vineyards. This particular landowner uh, apparently is also not overly generous, but he's not overly misery, miserly uh, either uh, in his marketplace negotiations trying to contract with workers. And he agrees to pay them a single denarius. A denarius was kind of like the... Uh, the minimum wage, uh, the standard fare for a full day's work. And a normal day back in this day uh, was about 12 hours. It was thought to be uh, from dawn until the first stars were visible in the evening sky. Obviously, that is a long, exhausting day of work, especially one in which manual labor was pretty uh, intense as well. So after this landowner goes to the market and, and uh, hires this first batch of workers, the landowner then returns to the market around 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the marketplace was kind of like a, a union hall, where if you wanted laborers, that's where you went. went. Uh, you could buy all kinds of things, including the laborers of one, and these were not, uh, these were not slaves. They were earning a living through their, um, through their work. And um, he finds there still some more unemployed laborers, and uh, he promptly hires them and sends them off to work into his vineyard. That scene is repeated again at about 12 noon, again at 3 o'clock, and again at 5 o'clock in the evening with probably only a couple of hours left in the work day. And in verse 8, the second half of the parable begins. The landowner gives his uh, manager some very specific instructions of how uh, he is to pay all of these workers. And rather than what would have been customary for the, those who were hired first to be paid first, he reverses that and he, hire, he pays those who were last hired first. So not only do these folks uh, who were hired first have to uh, witness the landowner's generosity towards those who were paid later, but they also have to wait around a little bit longer, and they're exhausted. They've been working a full day, and they'd like to get home to their families, but they have to wait until these uh, latecomers get their, get their pittance. Well, the landowner's pay scale is a very simple one. Everybody is getting the same amount. One denarius, one day's wage, regardless of the length of time when they punched in on the clock. And immediately, you know there's going to be trouble. There's trouble for the, to the listener who's hearing this, to the readers who later on, and to us even reading this, um, and certainly to those, those early workers. Because they assume, wow, seeing that these guys who came late are getting paid this amount, wow, we're going to get a bonus for having been there from the very start. But when they don't, when the listeners bristle, and the readers of this bristle, and we bristle, suddenly we have a, a righteous indignation. We like to call it righteous anger instead of just anger. We're ticked off that, hey, wait a minute, this is not fair. This is not right. What are you thinking? In fact, they're so upset that they take the chance of voicing their dismay about this decision to the actual landowner. Usually that was never done. You took your... Uh, uh, pay, whatever, and, and left. Hence, uh, perhaps not being hired again if you complained about it. And so they're complaining to the one in charge. And interesting to note that their complaint isn't really about money at all. It's not about renegotiating or saying, hey, hey wait a minute, do you realize the complaint itself focuses on something other than the money? And it's telling. The, uh, the first hired were at the marketplace, probably again um, right at dawn. 
hoping to get a full day's uh, pay for a full day's work. And those who showed up later than, uh, than that did so knowing that their chances were going to be slimmer to get any kind of work for that particular day. And they expected that their wages would indeed be less. Well, this was made clearer by the first uh, hired worker's outcry, as though, hey, you know what, only the lazy, the shiftless, the, the unconcerned individuals would show up for work or to, uh, to even take on work at 5 o'clock in the evening. Come on, there's only a couple of hours of light left. And so it's no wonder that these uh, first hired are appalled that the landlorder made these latecomers, made them equal to us. And just as surprising as these workers voicing the concern to the landowner, equally surprising is that this landowner is defending himself against their charges of unfairness. He didn't have to do anything. These were just laborers. He could do without them. But he says, you know, I paid you exactly what we agreed upon, right? I kept my word to all of you of what you were to be paid. And as for those who came late, this landowner asserts, it's his decision to do whatever he likes with them. He doesn't have to hold, uh, be of account to these others. And even while admonishing these, uh, these workers, the landowner also, I think rather graciously and compassionately, gives these guys a way out. In verse 5, he says, and, and really kind of saying, wait a minute, I know you're upset, but let's think about this for a minute. Cool off, and I think you're going to see that I can do what I want. And in verse 15, he says, the landowner to these workers, are you going to get stingy because I'm generous? Oh, okay, maybe this is the graceful out. We don't know how those workers responded because the parable stops right here. As I'm reading this, I'm thinking, okay, who cares how they responded? How would I respond? Would I be in the front of the lines with a, with a poster saying unfair wages, don't work for this guy, being critical, bad-mouthing him? Or would I accept the generosity and to realize that I was taking some money home to sustain my family? Matthew um, adds sort of like a final summary or an addendum to this parable in verse 16 where he, he says that the kingdom of heaven is like, that the first will be last and the last will be first in that kingdom of God. I'm not sure if the workers were still hanging around um, if Jesus said that or, uh, or what, but if they even would have heard it because of their anger and frustration. This parable is not about social economic standings as much as it is about God's amazing grace. There's that word again that we use and sing so much about. That this landowner's generosity is bestowed upon these uh, last hired laborers for a reason that's known only to him. Only to him. And as the one in charge, he does not explain or apologize for sort of lavishly giving the same wage to all that he has hired that day, regardless of the amount of time that they had logged in on the job. In fact, the only real response that the landowner has to these disgruntled first hirees is, am I not allowed to do what I choose? Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Is God not allowed to do what God chooses with what belongs to God? He is in charge. God is God, and I am not. Likewise, when God exercises his own unique way of doing things that seldom matches my expectations or my thoughts, ways that I don't agree with or ways that I can't grasp even where he would begin to get this idea to, to do that. That's when I ask, who's in charge? Theologically here, we are talking about a big word, sovereignty. 
If we grew up with kings and queens, we'd know a lot more about it than we do here in America. But sovereignty can be defined as having supreme authority, control, and power over all that has happened, is happening, and will happen in the future, in all times across all history. Paul summarizes that in his letter to the Romans when he says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Easy words to read and to believe until they're challenged by God doing something or allowing something to happen to us that we cannot fathom why. Personally, regionally, nationally, globally. The sovereignty of God is a reign that, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty uncomfortable with on a fairly regular basis. Most of us, I, would prefer a more democratic approach to things. I'd love it if that we could actively vote for the outcomes of events or, or to see where things are going in the future, to truly have a voice in that. And yet the sovereign rule of God leaves too many unwelcome subjects in our midst. Because of that, we have famine and disease and hate and war and envy and greed, despair, and just plain evil in our lives and in this world. But even in the face of all of those troubles that come with it, there's one mystery that is the greatest truth of all. This ultimate mystery of God's sovereign rule is the amazing grace of God for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We know it. It's easy to say it. It's hard to believe and accept when it costs us something. But in essence, it has really cost us nothing. Because the greatest action of God was the gift of this grace and the love all bound together in, into this world and one person of Jesus Christ. And the greatest sacrifice made by God was then the death of that love and grace on a cross for our sake and for our salvation. And I really have nothing to complain about with that. Thank God that God is God, then that I am not. God is in charge. There's no quest reason to question the authority and sovereignty of God just because things we don't understand what's happening or what, what did happen. Because God has every right to do what he purposes and all that he does is according to what pleases him. So, let's try to bring this back home to this very moment here this morning. We're in a period of what uh, I think we're referring to as a pastoral transition. Um, folks are asking, you know, who's in charge? And maybe even more so, Who's not in charge? Well, Reverend Schnell, even after serving 22 years as our senior pastor, he isn't in charge. Reverend Bowers is not in charge. But we are certainly appreciative of your reassuring presence with us, and I'm sure you'll be holding our hands through some of this. Uh, the other paid staff, they're not in charge. Our elected lay leadership and volunteers, you're not in charge. No members are in charge. Let's see, did I leave anyone out? Oh, well, there was that, that head of staff for a day guy, but he is definitely not in charge. A very dear friend, when I kind of get a little anxious, which I know you would think hard for me to, to do, for those of you who know me, um, always says, Jesus is still on the throne. <laughs> it may not be a, a verse, but it is certainly biblical. And I claim that many times. Jesus is still on the throne. That while many things have changed, many things have not, and certainly the most important has not. 
because God is still in charge. We're all important human instruments to accomplish the things that we're charged to do in the life of this church, but God is the one in charge. Um, folks have asked me what my future intentions are, and, and this sermon is part of my reply to that. And as a pastoral as well as a personal postscript to this message, I hope you will allow me just a few more moments to um, share some of my thoughts. Um, I truly believe and have for a long time that God calls us to specific tasks. And I believe he also calls us away from those tasks uh, as well. And so in the spring of 1981, um, I received uh, God's call to this, uh, the church in Aurora as their director of Christian education. Um, and that call has expanded over the years uh, to become a very full-time uh, role as an associate uh, minister, uh, working six days a week, averaging about 50 to 55 hours per week, uh, and being on call 24-7, 365 days out of the year. Um, I do recall, after having been here about five years, uh, somebody coming through the line and greeting me and, and said, I'm just curious, um, what is your real job? <laughs> well, you know what? Um, I love this job, um, especially the privileges and the blessings that you have afforded me uh, to walk with you through some of the highs and some of the lows of your life. And so now, 37 years later, I remain confident in, uh, in God's call uh, to this body of Christ in Aurora. And so since Bill's uh, retirement announcement, I have uh, had time to spend in prayer and reflection and meditation to discern God's will for my life and my work here uh, at uh, the church in Aurora. And uh, out of all of that, uh, God's peace has become uh, my peace with the desire a personal desire to continue as an associate minister here with you uh, as long as God and you uh, will certainly have me. Um, I am encouraged at the prospects of furthering and developing my um, pastoral experiences and skills um, because the emphasis for, for me is not on associate or interim or senior. It's on minister with God in charge. As the Apostle Paul put it, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Please rise.